I do want to welcome you. And uh, well, we're we've come a long way. Uh, here we are today. We're looking at Simon the Zealot. Uh, we've got two more to go after this. Uh, both of them are Judas, but one is Judas Thaddeus Libius, and the other one is Judas Iscariot, and that's the last one that we'll be studying in this particular series. I, I hope this has been beneficial. Uh, for you as far as not only learning about these men, but learning things uh, through their lives uh, that have served as a, a way of educating us uh, and challenging us, perhaps. Uh, I, I would hope so. Uh, I believe we're going to find that to be the case today with Simon the Zealot, too. If you want to go ahead and, and uh, mark your places in the Bible, we're going to be reading from Matthew's Gospel from the 10th chapter. We're going to read the first four verses in Matthew's uh, chapter 10, and we'll do that in just a few moments. But before we get started in our study, I want you to join me in prayer. Our Father, we want to thank you for this day. We are, are so appreciative of the, the rain that is coming down, and we know that that brings nourishment and all to, uh, to the things that are, are needful of it here in this world, just like we have come today for the nourishment that we need from you through your word. And we pray that you will uh, give us such as we study, that you'll help us to open our, our minds fully to you and then to your word as well, uh, that you might teach us something that will be a benefit for our lives, uh, not only blessing us, but perhaps increasing the capacity within our lives to be blessings for others as well. I thank you for those who are joining me here uh, at the church and for those who will be joining also online. Uh, and their interest in you and your word, uh, their desire to grow. Uh, it's my prayer that you, through your Holy Spirit, it, every one of us will experience that. We will s sense that we are growing not only in our knowledge, but we're growing also in our sense of closeness with you, becoming more the people you would have us to be. To you be the glory and all the praise through Jesus Christ. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. All right, if you have your Bibles, I want to go right into the study today. We're going to, as I said, be reading out of the 10th chapter of Matthew. I'm going to begin my reading now with verse 1. Jesus called his 12 disciples to him, and he gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. Now, these are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, who was who is also called Peter and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. And that is the reading of God's word. Obviously, you found already there's really nothing said other than the mentioning of his name. Simon the Zealot. You know, our Lord actually called two Simons to follow after him. One of them is very familiar to us. We know a whole lot about him because the Bible gives us a lot of information. He was somebody that uh, who said a lot and his words are recorded here in the Bible. He was somebody uh, who was involved and, 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 and noted to, uh, for being involved in so many ways in ministry. That's also found within the scriptures as well. But scripture is silent, if you will, almost altogether about this other Simon, Simon the Zealot. None of his words are recorded here in the Bible. Nothing that he ever did is mentioned here in the Bible other than indirectly. As it is said here, he went out with the others to you know, cast out demons, to, to heal the sick. So we know he must have been actively involved in this. But there is no real indication of it as far as the mentioning of his name with regard to any particular instance. And now he is uh, simply called the Zealot, Simon the Zealot. And yet I like what somebody once said, you know, it, you don't have to have a lot of information to learn a lot sometimes in the Bible. Sometimes even a word and I can teach you a, a great deal. Uh, someone else put it this way, through small window frames, you can see a big world. And so we're going to be looking through a small window frame today, but I think we're going to see a lot more than you might expect. I want to begin by giving you a couple of definitions. 
I, I want to begin with uh, the word zealot and all that is uh, mentioned uh, in the scriptures. Simon the zealot or zealot, you ever how you want to pronounce it. And I, I, but I think zealot is more commonly the way it's pronounced. What is a zealot? And I'll let me give you a, a, a simple definition. Uh, while there's a lot more that can be said, I'm not going to go into great detail because this is not really what I'm uh, interested in other than to give you the idea of what a zealot is. A, a militant radical, and a militant radical, radical who is enthusiastic about a cause. That cause may have to do with a person or with a, a movement, if you will. In the case of Simon, he and other Jewish zealots and uh, were continually trying to overthrow uh, a foreign uh, oppression, which was the Roman Empire, who uh, ruled and controlled Palestine. And it was their intent to drive them out one way or the other, even to the extent of, of using violence. Yeah, and, and many times that would be the case. And now, now, why would Jesus, why would Jesus choose a person uh, with this kind of a background? Uh, why would he choose someone like this to be one of his disciples and ultimately uh, also select him to be one of his closest, one of the 12? You know, why would someone like this be selected? You might think, you know, this person would be one of the last people you would want to consider. But then again, he did choose Matthew, who was a tax collector, didn't he? And, and of course, we will find out a little more about another one that he chose, uh, Judas called Iscariot. And, uh, but we, you know, we don't always understand the mind of God. Uh, and, and many instances, uh, we only understand it because of what he's revealed to us. And so that we could understand it. And, uh, but he knew exactly what he was doing. Let me give you a, a, a definition of the word zeal, because that's where the word zealot comes from, from the same root word. Zeal is somebody who is, again, enthusiastic, somebody who is energized, who is motivated, uh, who is determined. Uh, I think those can be positive qualities. Uh, and I think that's something that uh, the church needs a lot of. They need, it need that, that needs that kind of quality in, in the people of God. We need more people who are enthusiastic about who they are and about uh, whose they are and about what they are what they are doing in, that, in His name. Uh, we need people that uh, are more energized, people that are more determined uh, to see God do His work in them, and also see God do the work He desires to do through their lives as well. I think uh, this idea of zeal, obviously, is a powerful thing. Uh, it not only changes somebody, but it also is a motivation to be a changer. And that's, that's important you know, because the church uh, needs to be changed inwardly and be a, 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 a power of change outwardly. And I think Jesus indicated this, didn't he, when he said, you are the light of the world. Light changes things. When he says you are the salt uh, of the earth, salt changes things. Salt has a big impact. Jesus uses a lot of different words in which to convey that particular idea. Now, as being uh, someone who is zealous, that can be a good thing. Now, it can be a bad thing as well, we have to admit. Uh, but, uh, but, it's, but it can be a good thing. Now, somebody who is zealous, uh, if, they're, if they're not uh, rightly motivated, uh, obviously, they're going to do more damage. They're going to do more harm uh, by far than they are going to be able to, to do good. Uh, somebody who is zealous, but they don't have the right understanding, uh, it can make a lot of uh, bad choices. Uh, and and, and they're, uh, uh, with the determination that they have, they can determine a lot of things that are not necessarily good. I want you to write this down. It comes from Romans chapter 10. And these are the words of the Apostle Paul when he was writing to the church at Rome. He said this, Brothers, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. For I testify about them that they are zealous. They are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. Now, Paul is not only speaking about his brothers, he's really confessing something about himself because he was there too at one time. He was quite zealous himself, but without knowledge. And, and so he did a lot of things in, in, in light of that zeal, uh, thinking that he was doing good when actually he was doing very bad. He was doing a lot more harm 
And uh, so, uh, so why would God want to take a chance? Why would Jesus want to take a chance on a man with such powerful emotions as what was driving Simon the Zealot? And I think that the reason he took he was willing to take a chance with him is because he saw within him something, and all that we that uh, did not necessarily reveal itself to everybody outwardly. You see, the Lord can take what is negative, and when it's in His hands, He can make it become something positive. He can take what has been used for bad, but when it's in His hands, He can make it to be used for what is good. And all He has the ability to reshape lives that are going in the wrong direction and ultimately get those lives going in the right direction. And I know that that's what he had in his heart. Uh, his intent was for Simon. He saw a man with a lot of potential. And if that potential could be molded and shaped and used in a, in a positive way, it could do much for the kingdom of God. Uh, you know, I, I, a lot of, you've seen it in, in other people, too, the things that were driving them to do wrong once they were converted, once they were brought over to, into the into the kingdom through Jesus Christ. They use that same that same emotion and that same determination this time from the, from this time forward to do what was good. And, uh, and that's a, and that's a very positive thing. So God doesn't have to get rid of all of your qualities that have led you to do wrong. He just needs to get them channeled rightly and also that they can be used to do what is right. So they could be used in a, in a way that is positive. Uh, Charles Spurgeon had something to say along these lines. And uh, he said, I wish more Christians were like Simon the Zealot. And he said this. He said, if sinners are zealous in their sins, should not saints be zealous for their God? If the things of time can stir the human passions, should not the realities of eternity have a greater and more tremendously moving force? If these men will spend and be spent and stretch every nerve and run the race merely for the crown of politics or ambition, where are we? What idlers and laggards we are that we pursue the things of God, but with a half, half a heart. And, and and that's that's quite a uh, uh, you know a, a thing to have to say, but but there's unfortunately truth in that, you know truth. In, we 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 shouldn't go at being a, a Christian half-heartedly. We we shouldn't worship half-heartedly. Uh, we should work half-heartedly, and uh, we shouldn't witness half-heartedly. We should give ourselves fully to the things of God because we are so richly blessed by that which is of God. And, and we should be excited to be able to have the opportunity not only to possess this, but to be able to share it with the rest of the world. Now, the Bible, let me tell you, zeal is a very good thing. In fact, the Bible uses the word zeal many times. Now, there's some instances where it's noting something that is not good, but there's many instances where it notes that which is very good. Did you know your God is a zealous God and a zealous God? Your God is is very zealous about the things that he does on behalf of you. And uh, he, he gives himself passionately and fully and all to the things that he does on your behalf, whether it's providing for you or protecting you, uh, whatever it might be. Uh, he, he doesn't take it lightly. And those that come against his people, he goes against them zealously, if you will. So And, and it talks about God's people in the Bible in some instances, and their zeal as well. Jesus was zealous. He was very passionate in terms of what he did and in terms of his ministry. Again, Charles Spurgeon has this to say in that line. He says, a prophet tells us that Jesus was clothed with zeal as with a cloak. He had not zeal over a part of him, but was clothed with it as with some great cloak covering him from head to foot. Christ was all zeal, all zeal. And, and I think that's true. I, I, I think that's that's very true. And, and we are challenged as, as God's people, write this down, Romans chapter 12 and verse 11, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. And I'll, that's Romans chapter 12. And verse 11, 
Now, what I'm going to do in the remainder of our time in this particular study is to give you some areas in which that zeal should be uh, should be uh, obvious, uh, and, uh, and and I believe in every Christian's life. So, if you want to take notes and follow me in that manner, then you can do so. The first one is this: there should be a zeal for Christ. <laughs> that should be number one. Should a zeal for Christ. And uh, Paul had such a zeal, and I'm going to share him with you as an example. Uh, I'm not going to be turning in my Bible to these scriptures for the sake of time, but I, I've given you some of them in your notes, and I'm going to be giving you others. And if those are if these are not in your notes, then go ahead and, and write them down, and you can read them on your own at a later time. And check me out. See if what I'm giving you is accurate, okay? Because I, I, I want you to do that. Believe it or not. It is very rare, but I do make a mistake from time to time, <laughs> okay? Maybe not as rare as I'd like to think, and I, but I, but I, so check me out. Make sure I'm, I'm telling you uh, the facts. I mean to tell you the facts, but don't just take my word for it. You follow through and check it out. Paul, when he was writing to the church at Philippi, uh, he had this to say. He talked about his own personal zeal. And it's in, I believe, uh, I want to say the third chapter. I, I, I may be wrong, but I think it's the third chapter of Philippians where Paul talks about the zeal he once possessed before he became a Christian. And he talks about how, how he was, you know, you're talking about a Jew, man. I was a Jew among Jews. I was, I was there. I gave myself to everything that, uh, that was intended that defines what a Jew is supposed to be. I poured myself into it. A Pharisee, he says, I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. I mean, Paul didn't do anything half-heartedly. He poured himself, his life into what he believed, into what he, what he thought uh, he should be. Uh, he said, in fact, as for zeal, he says, and this is in verse six in chapter three, he said, as for zeal, he said, I was a persecutor of the church. You know, so he didn't go at that halfway either because he felt at that time the church was uh, was a was a, a heresy uh, that Jesus Christ was not someone he had ever trusted in or and he couldn't uh, you know stand those who did. He, he persecuted the church. He, he did everything he could to, to stamp it out, you know, to, com to completely obliterate it. Uh, and, uh, you know, even asked for credentials from those higher up that he might have the authority to take uh, to take his uh, cause and, and to the furthest degree, uh, even to the point of having them uh, imprisoned, even at times, like in the case of Stephen, having them stoned and put to death. So Paul was pouring his life into this, but something changed, didn't it? On the road to Damascus, we know the great light and we know Paul's conversion. And suddenly he didn't lose that zeal, but that zeal became you know, differently channeled now. Now Jesus Christ was in control of the man with this zeal and this zeal was being used. Everything he worked so hard against, he now poured his life into with everything he had for it. And he talks about it. He says, I want to experience Jesus Christ to every degree, whatever it is, even in, even in light of his suffering. I want to experience that. I don't want to leave anything out. I don't want just the, the things that we might consider the good things, but even the hard things he had to go through. I want to know what it was like for him. I want, I'm ready to experience it all. And he says, it's not like I've already attained all this, but I press on. I press toward that mark. And I give myself to everything that I have. I let go of what I need to let go so that I can take hold of what I need to take hold of to become the person that God wants me to be. Paul was zealous. He was zealous for the Lord, wasn't he? And uh, now uh, you can, as I said, you can be misguided as he was at one time. And boy, that was detrimental. That was very damaging. But when you are guided rightly, it becomes something very wonderful, something very powerful. No one had done, probably did more for the church other than the Lord himself, than the Apostle Paul, because of the zeal that drove him uh, in terms of, of ministry. When he was writing to the church at Galatia, he talked to them about zeal, and he, and he was concerned that some of them had the same misguided zeal that he had had. And, and he, wrote, he wrote to them and challenged them in light of that. Write this down, Galatians chapter 1, 
and verse 14. Galatians chapter 1, verse 14. He says, I was just like you at one time. I advanced, he says, I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries. I thought like you that this is what it was all about. And he says, but he says, but now he says, even then being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my, fa my, my fathers. But he said, my heart changed. My heart changed. And, and he's, he's pleading with them that they too let go of the things that are leading them uh, to, to pour their lives into something that is not really going to change their lives. That's not really going to bring them closer to God and to give their lives fully to the Lord that they might be able to, to realize the fullness of Jesus Christ. Uh, don't let something get in your way that is going to rob you of, of such an experience. That's going to keep you from knowing God and from growing in God as you are, are meant to do so. Uh, no, but pour yourself, in, once you get hold of the truth, pour yourself into that truth so that it might set you free and help you to become what you're meant to be. Uh, I like what he says again when he writes to the Romans. You can write this down, Romans chapter 12. And in verse 11, he says, do not be lazy, he says, but work hard serving the Lord with all your heart. And the word that is commonly translated as zeal is there when it talks about with all your heart. You know, work with, you're working for the Lord and all, you know, and, and everything we do for him should be with all our heart. It, there shouldn't be anything reserved, anything we, that we would hold back. Uh, now, we may not be able to, to be perfect in what we do. Uh, we may not be able to do certainly everything, but whatever we do, we do it with all our heart for the Lord because he is at the center of our lives and we want to please him. So well, there should be this zeal, obviously, for Christ. Every one of us should be excited about our relationship with God through him and be excited about the relationship we are having, we have now with him as we walk in his steps, as we follow his leading for our lives. But that zeal carries over not only for Christ, but we love what he loves. So the second thing is a zeal for the church. You know, our Lord loved the church. He laid his life down for the church so that he was passionate about that. And, and we should have a, a zeal for the church as well. And now there is a, a scripture that I want to call to your attention. Uh, and it is uh, found in John's gospel in chapter 2. Uh, and uh, in verses 12 through 17 mainly, those were the, where the words are, are particularly found. It says, after this, uh, Jesus went down to Capernaum with, uh, with his mother and brothers and his disciples. Uh, the, I think this is following what the the, uh, the first miracle, isn't it? Uh, uh, that's mentioned. Okay, uh, there they stayed for a few days, and when it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords, and he drove all of them out of the temple courts, both sheep and cattle, and he scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those, uh, that, to those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. And his disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. Jesus was zealous. Don't think of him as a, some laid back guy that spoke softly, you know, and, 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 and just, you know, took whatever. It, when and Jesus was very passionate about his father in heaven. He was very passionate about everything that represented him here on earth, including the church itself. His zeal was more than just for the building, but it was for what the building stood for. It was a house of prayer. And uh, it was for the people that came to worship there, the people whose lives would be would be influenced and some be changed because of what they experienced there. And all of this was being threatened and uh, by those who were misusing the house of God. And uh, and Jesus was zealous about you know driving these people out, and uh, because they had no real place in the house of God. 
we are supposed to be zealous about what goes on here and what goes on amongst those who are represented by this place. The church is more than a building. The church are people, but the people who reside here in the sense of meeting here for worship and fellowship and for, for other things that they do that leads to the service of the Lord. And all we should be zealous toward one another in the sense that we should be motivating one another to be the people that we all are professing ourselves to be. Write this down, Hebrews chapter 10. And in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 24, it says, and let us consider how we may spur, and there's the word that also uh, connects with the word zeal, how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. We should be doing things that motivate each other and all to, to express the, the life of Christ that's in us and all to live a life that expresses that love in terms of the good deeds that our lives produce as a result. And all our lives are, uh, uh, good works are not what makes us Christian, but good works are what comes from us because we are Christians, because we are the children of God. So when we talk about zeal, it's only right that we, that this word find its place in our relationship with Christ, but also in our relationship with his church as well. We should be zealous there. And thirdly, there should be a zeal in terms of Christian service, not just within the the workings of the church, but through the church and out into the world as well. Write this down, Titus chapter two and verse 14. Jesus gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and he might purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works and uh, of good works. Then uh, that's what he's, uh, he's driving us. He's driving us to, to, to be different in order that we might make a difference. He's driving us out into the world, if you will, because there is darkness that needs to, needs light. And now uh, there are things that are ruining that need the salt in which to, to change them and to, and to preserve them. Uh, our, our impact, the impact of our lives and our witness need to be in all of these particular places. Now in Romans, I mean, in Corinthians, uh, he mentions in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, when he's talking about the various gifts that we should earnestly desire the most helpful gifts. We should, these are gifts that not, that don't establish us in terms of making us something great, but they allow us to do great things. And when he writes to the Colossians, he tells us, uh, you know, uh, he tells us about this in more detail. In Colossians 3 and in verse 23, in Colossians 3 and verse 23, he said, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as one working for the Lord and not for men. With all your heart, again, there is the, the, the there is it comes from the root of the word zeal, zeal or zealous, and all to to do it with all your heart, with with enthusiasm, with determination, and uh, with uh, giving it your all. That's how we should be serving, and all we we don't do anything half-heartedly, even when we are doing service for our Lord and we're reaching out to people. We don't do just what we think we can get by with. We do what, with God's help, whatever it is that we can do to make the greatest difference of all uh, in the world in which we live. Uh, the, we don't do it. We are not half-hearted people, not in our relationship with God, not in our relationship with his church, and not in our relationship with the world either. But we go at the world with everything within our heart to be a difference for this world. And it needs that difference, just like as it, need, it needs the difference of Jesus. It needs the difference of what who Jesus is through his people as well. But there's one more thing that I want to bring to your attention today uh, before I, I close in, in light of this particular disciple, Simon the Zealot. The Zealot, he teaches us also about a zeal for country. And that's the fourth thing, a zeal for country. Uh, and, and Simon had a zeal for his country. There's no question about it. In fact, that's how we come to know him, first of all, as a man who was a zealot. And uh, he had a zeal for, for his country. Uh, to the point that he was ready to, to destroy uh, the people that were now uh, controlling his country, to take it out of their hands so that they could be free and become the people that they were supposed to be. Uh, and by the way, while we might, you know, uh, uh, you know, 
be concerned about Simon the Zealot uh, and, and his uh, use of force. Uh, I will remind you that when Jesus was arrested on that night, you know, Simon drew a sword and cut off a man's ear, but it wasn't the Zealot. <laughs> it wasn't. <laughs> So, so there was another Simon that needed a little work too on his life, and that, and that was Simon the Peter, and uh, he had to have a little work on his life. But again, the zeal for the zeal for country or, or is not a bad thing. Now we are we are not uh, the word the word America and the word Christian is not synonymous. Okay, I know that. Hopefully, you know that. Uh, you can be a Christian without necessarily being an American. Obviously, there are Christians all over the world. You can be an American without being a Christian. And that's obvious, too. We've got a lot of people in this country who, who don't even you know, pretend to profess Jesus Christ as their Savior. So we're not talking about one and the same. But we, as Americans because of where God has put us here in the world in which we live. And this would be the case wherever we might be, have been put. We are to use the, the godly influence that's been, uh, you know, upon our lives as to make a, a, to be a godly influence in the, in the country in which we live. Write this down, Galatians chapter four and verse 18. It is fine to be zealous, provided the purpose is good, okay? Now, there are a lot of people that are zealous in politics right now, and some good and some bad. And, and it's, it's scary where the, where the emotions of our country are, are going right now. They're going all over the place. And, and there's not a whole lot to feel good about when it's, when it's being said and done. Uh, but zeal can be a good thing. And uh, when it's when it's provided, it's the purpose is good. And if we're going to make a difference in our country, I'm not saying stop voting, but I'm saying I hope you do a lot more than vote. And, and I hope you don't think just because you're voting, the person you're putting in there is going to change your country. Only God's going to change your country and he might change the heart of that person you put in there. That will help change your country. But but God alone is going to change this country. If it's changed in any way that is going to be for good, it's going to be because of him. He gets the glory for that. And uh, he always has gotten the glory for it. It's not just in this moment. It's in our past. And uh, anything good that came out, it came out in our country, I trace it back to the hand of the Lord. And anything in the future, I still look to the hand of the Lord to be involved there as well. Uh, but uh, again, I'm, I'm patriotic to a point, but I'm a Christian much further than I am a patriot. I'm a Christian. And when that gets in the way of being a Christian, I'm a Christian. And all that's always number one. You know, he's he's number one in my life. But here's a couple of places you might want to read uh, in light of our relationship to the country in which we are a part. Uh, Romans chapter 13 uh, is one. First Peter in chapter two. Uh, there's there's several verses in those chapters that I want you to take your time later and, and look it up and and read and let God, uh, you know, speak to your heart and your mind. Uh, it talks about submissiveness. Uh, but our submissiveness begins with submissiveness to the Lord. But we are also to live submissively to people around us, even people in authority. And we try to respect the, 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 our, the authority. Now, it's hard to do that, to, to, I know, depending on who's holding that particular post. But we're supposed to respect the authority. See, that's why you have to respect me. And I'll, you know, because I'm a, I'm a your pastor, you, Dwayne, you might not think a lot of, but you've got to respect your pastor. <laughs> okay, you got to you got to do that. And uh, you got to respect the office of authority. And uh, because God is the one who either allows or disallows, if you will. All through the Bible, we see this. Uh, you know, don't think God is ever outwitted. That God is, is ever outpowered, that somehow, you know, evil has got the upper hand on the Lord. He may have the upper hand on you, and all evil may. Evil may have taken advantage of you, but never the Lord. You know, even what seems to be is not, you know, because history tells us in time, you know, who, who always comes out on top? God does, always. So don't think that somehow, even when it looks like evil has got the upper hand, that it actually does. God, uh, someone has said one time, when you're asked the question, where is this world going to, you remind them, it's going to God. 
<laughs> That's where it's going. Right now, it may not look like it, but it is. Ultimately, it's going to be the Lord's uh, altogether without dispute. Right now, there are a few people that want to dispute the fact, but they're going to be eliminated in time. But uh, I like this also that the uh, that it says in First Peter chapter two. It says, "Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, and a lot of times just being a Christian makes you wrong. We're living at a time when that's the case." But he says, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good works and glorify God. Ultimately, and all uh, that's the way we, we if we're going to win them over that we will. And uh, by being consistent in our relationship with the Lord, we can be a, a consistent witness to the country in which we now live. Well, I'm going to bring this to a close as far as my comments today. And I want to begin with another quote from Charles Spurgeon, who had a lot to say on this subject of zeal uh, with respect to Simon the Zealot. He said, brethren, we would not condemn the use of zeal in common affairs of life, would we? For zeal is essential to success. We only wish that Christians would, would take copy from worldly men and be half as earnest and half as ambitious to maintain and increase the kingdom of their Lord and master as some men are after petty trifles or selfish glorifications. I think that's a good thing to stop with in terms of zeal. And Simon the Zealot tradition tells us that, uh, well, there's, 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 he, like I said, he's, he's sort of mysterious fella. Even tradition is not altogether agreed on, on what ever happened to this particular apostle. One said he preached to the Berbers in uh, North Africa, and it was while he was ministering in that area that he was martyred. He was sawn in half. And uh, once that's one tradition. There's other traditions. Another one that I read said that he accompanied the apostle Jude to Persia, and it was there that he eventually suffered a martyr's death. But most will say, uh, without a doubt, he suffered a martyr's death, as did uh, you know most of the others. Uh, but as far as where he he did his ministry, uh, one said he was all over the place. <laughs> he was here for a while and there, uh, like the Apostle Paul. He traveled a bit in terms of his ministry before ultimately he laid down his own life for his Lord, who had laid down his life for him. Uh, now, next uh, time that we get together, we're going to talk about Judas. Not the Iscariot, but Judas, Thaddeus, Livius. Uh, that's the Judas we're going to talk about uh, in our, our next uh, study. And I hope you'll be able to come and be a part of it as well. Let's close with prayer. Father, I want to thank you for this uh, study today, for the things that, that I felt in, uh, challenged and, and enlightened by. Uh, and, and just uh, be able to have the opportunity to share this with others. I pray that it will... It will uh, increase their uh, curiosity and their interest and, and, and digging deeper. Sometimes when they come across something that seems to be so trifle in a sense that it's only mentioned the once, they might not stop at that moment and, and just dismiss it as such, but, but maybe look for ways to dig deeper to see if there's not something more that is being said than, than what just seems to be there on the, on the immediate surface. Yeah, your word is rich. It's full. Uh, lessons abound. And uh, we need these for our spiritual growth. Uh, to you we give the glory and to you we give all the praise through Jesus Christ our Lord. For it's in his name we pray. Amen.